welcome to Occupolitics, a Harry Potter reread podcast focusing on politics in the wizarding world. As always, I'm Adri, your host and a recovering English major. And I'm Helene, your co-host and producer. And today we are going to be talking about Chapter 14, The Thief of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But before we get to that, Helene, how are you? I'm... It's been a roller coaster. Uh, upsides, I got a new couch. Uh, downsides, my dad's been having some scary health issues. So, you know, <laughs> I don't think they're really equivalent, but <laughs> I'm trying to take the good with the bad here. <laughs> if this is not the picture of adulthood of upside, I bought a couch, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't a know couch is. is a large purchase. I think that all adults would agree getting a new couch is an exciting thing. Oh, no, I am not saying this in a derogatory way no, in, I, in, by any means. It's just like, I too would be excited if I got a couch. <laughs> yes, everybody, everybody over a certain age will understand my enthusiasm, I think. I got a Costco membership. That was very exciting for me. I've been debating doing that for a while. I think I have to wait until I get a place that has more storage space because as a single person, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to use all of it in a short amount of time. So like I want all of the bulk stuff. I just don't know where to put it when I'm not using it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was really excited uh, this past if it wasn't if it wasn't this past weekend, I don't know time, you know, anymore. <laughs> I got like like a bunch of uh, dishwashing soap that usually like is four dollars at the grocery store, and then I got like two and a half times or more that, but for like ten dollars. So I was nice. very excited. Love yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, and and by four dollars at the grocery store, I mean on a really good day. It's usually like six. You yeah, know? yeah, totally. Um, and I got uh, obviously like stuff for the baby, like their um, diapers are really great, and also ha- half the price of <laughs> Huggies, which is amazing. Um, I'm, I'm bargain shopping here because like having a child is expensive. Who knew? Who knew? No one ever told me. Mm, this is why <laughs> I waited so long to have children. Um, and. What else did I get? I got a bunch of stuff and I was like, I am living the dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like oh, toilet paper in bulk. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. That's, that's a dream as well. Yeah. I feel like it's, you've reached a, like an achievement when you are an adult and have a Costco membership. Like they also have rotisserie chicken for like five bucks, which yeah. life goal I'm here for. Yeah, life goal unlocked for sure. And um, they're hot dogs and a, you know, is it like it's like hot dog and a soda for one fifty? Yeah, I've heard that their like food there is is pretty unbeatable. I am the cheapest date on the earth, so I'm just like, yes, <laughs> great date, babe. <laughs> that and like IKEA hot dogs. I'm like, yes, take yeah. me out to IKEA for a very fancy date. <laughs> yes, IKEA has good food. It's true. <sighs> They have good good food, good furniture, good everything. I love yeah, it. It's a great place to be. Was it like two months ago where we were in Ikea on the same exact day and we didn't know it? Like, obviously, yeah. different states. But, yeah, you know. different states. But yeah, you sent me a picture of a thing that you saw at Ikea and I was like, oh my God. And I, like, I went and I sent a picture of the same exact thing because I was literally at, a, at an Ikea the same day. <laughs> I was yeah, like, I, I see yeah. that too. <laughs> it's like us both looking up at the moon at the same time and we're looking at the same moon. <laughs> The soul of a poet, Helene. You have the soul of a poet. <laughs> Thank you. I know. It's it's a, it's a skill. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So life updates aside. Um, also, again, is, you know, sorry that your dad's dealing with some scary health issues. I hate this for you. And I get scared every time my dad or my mom has, like, a doctor's appointment or whatever because I'm like this is like it's just one 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 day it's just gonna happen because that's life right um yeah I I won't talk about it a lot right now just because I get I get really emotional but um my dad is my favorite person full stop um he's the best person I've ever known and uh so it 
it's really like I, I remember I used to I used to always like get teary just thinking about anything possibly happening to him. And that was when he was completely fine. So um, I've had na- nightmares of my dad dying like almost my whole life. Like it's like my biggest fear. So it's good. It's tough. It's really um, I it's. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. No, um, I'm not going to make you talk about it. I'm just I just wanted to, you know, yeah, I know yeah. I told you off mic, but I also wanted to, you know tell you right now i'm really sorry about it um thank you i don't know what it feels like because it hasn't happened to me yet you know but it is one of my biggest fears right so yeah yeah Yeah, i'll I'll keep i'll keep you guys updated um as things progress but hopefully hopefully nothing you know hopefully it doesn't get worse that's is my hope so we'll see yeah i hope that there's some good to come out of all of this and it is not <laughs> your worst fears how about that yeah me too um speaking of scary things the, the midterm elections are coming up yes they are if and you the- haven't been tipped off by the millions of text messages from random people asking who you're going to vote for or uh the million pieces of mail that you've gotten reminding you to register to vote um yeah, the terms are are fast approaching. <laughs> yeah, and um, we need everyone to feel empowered to go vote because the worst thing that could happen is that people are like, "Why should I vote? Nothing ever changes. Look at this." Da 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 da, and that's how um people in the minority gain power and strip away more of our rights. So please go vote. Yeah, I mean, I think the listeners would be shocked to hear that this is a pro voting podcast. Uh-uh. what <laughs> oh no go register to vote go register to vote do it go vote democrat go vote blue um let's get some of these crazy bigoted election denying transphobic assholes you know, anti-feminist assholes out of the power because they not they not need it anymore get them out of here yeah, these dinosaurs need to go. You know, like, yeah. listen, you had your run, the entirety of humanity, let us have equality. That's all I want, equality. For for me, for you, for everyone, and for the world that I am hoping that my child will live in, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Anyway... What else happened uh, since last time we recorded, Lee? Um, some sl- slightly good news. Well, I guess, like, you know, I mean, it's it's news on the p- more positive side of the spectrum, I guess. Um, s- s- Trump is finally starting to possibly be held accountable for his actions. The January 6th committee uh, announced last week, per, uh, per our recording time, that um, they are issuing a subpoena for Trump to testify in front of the committee. Not that that is going to be enforced necessarily, or any real consequences will come from him neglecting to appear for the subpoena. Uh, But it's more of a political statement, um, I think, unless you have different insight into it. It's basically them just, you know, saying, we're putting it on the record. We're asking you to come. You've said you'd do it in the past and uh you know if you don't it just kind of shows that you are full of shit which we all knew already so yeah to me it sounds more like an elaborate game of chicken of where it's like oh you you said you do it cool like let me dot my i's and cross my t's and uh ask you to do it and see what happens yeah yeah we'll see what we'll see what comes of it (laughs) it's just like when i tell Seth like oh do you want me to order taco bell and he's like sure order taco bell i'm like are you sure you want taco bell and he's like yeah go ahead and we're like both like trying to like who blinks first because it's just drunk food for us not like sober food um and i'm asking him this while sober and i'm like yeah i went ahead and ordered it and he's like fine okay and then like 20 minutes later he's like where's the taco bell coming i was like i didn't order it i'm ordering it McAllister's instead or something <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh you guys are funny uh 
deranged, maybe, yes. That too. <laughs> that too. Uh, that's that's cute. Yeah, that's that's it. That's that's the news so far. But uh speaking of news, tell us what happened in chapter 14 of Deathly Hallows. Yeah, this is the one where after Ron is splinched during their getaway attempt from the ministry, the trio settle into a campsite in the woods and try to figure out their next move. Ron insists they stop using Voldemort's name, much to Harry and Hermione's dismay, but since he almost did die, they decide to respect his wishes. Whatever. Um, while, taking, <laughs> <laughs> while taking turns, keeping watch outside the tent, Harry has a vision of Voldemort killing Gregorovich and seeing a young blonde, quote-unquote, Mary thief, which we know is Grindelwald, uh, steal something Harry qu- can't quite see, which we know is the Elder Wand. <laughs> Mary thief is always cracks me up. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I have thoughts about this chapter. <laughs> okay, tell me tell me about the thoughts before we get into the politics then. Um so basically this chapter didn't feel like a chapter in a Harry Potter book. Okay. Like, I don't know if you agree, but like it was badly written like a lot of it didn't make sense the things like there were lots of uncharacteristic things nothing nothing was explained particularly well like if you're Mm -hmm. going to have characters do something uncharacteristic like and this is a series that's been going on for seven books like these people are like we are invested we know the characters we love the characters we know the characters inside and out If a character is going to do something uncharacteristic, like, it should be obvious why to the reader. And if it's not obvious, you need to explain it. Like, so there were were just choices made in this chapter that I found stupid and uncharacteristic. And I just, I just felt like it was badly written. I don't, you're, you're an English major. What would you, would you agree? (laughs) Okay, I'm going to, like, drop a hot take here. Okay. (laughs) Oh, my God, this is going to get me canceled. Um, Believe it or not, just because we enjoy, like, Harry Potter as, like, a series that touched our hearts, right, does not mean it's well-written. Upon further reflection on the series as, you know, as, as, as an adult, you know, a lot of it is not what we would say well written. See, ninety nine percent of the time, I finish a chapter and I'm like, "That was a good chapter. Like that was well written. That like I I usually think that that it's that especially in this re in this reread too. Like I'm like, yeah, I mean, this girl, this woman is a bigot and she's not who we thought we she was, and she's you know really not a great person. It it turns out, but she can write a damn book. And okay, with okay, this okay. chapter, me, I just was like, no, this was bad. Let me make a distinction, right? Like, okay. there's a difference between plot, which I think she usually excels at, mm-hmm. at plotting, and how you word something, right? Mm-hmm. In my... She needed a better editor sometimes, I think. That That is my take on this. Like, sometimes, like, in the earlier books, you could tell she had more editing done than in, like, the later books. Yeah. To where, like, she gets too verbose and too over the top with her language, where it's yeah. like, you could have said that more succinctly and let's move on yeah. type thing. Um, and the way yeah. that she characterizes the you know like does the characterization of people in the series kind of falters a little bit in the later books and i i i bring that down to editing and like these books were so hugely popular that how are you gonna tell the author no also like the editor probably just got so damn bored with this camping stuff that she was like i don't fucking care and just didn't like she's like what are you trying well the the (laughs) The role of the good editor, right, my understanding is, like, to always tie it back to what is this chapter or scene doing yeah. to further the story, right? Yeah. So 
what is this showing? What is this doing? And this chapter was all about the one hiding again and telling, letting Harry know, like, you can't go back to Grimmauld Place. So, like, taking away the safe place they had found. So destabilizing the characters, right? And then giving us insight into Voldemort's mind. Everything else seems to be just, like, filler. Maybe that's why we're just having, like, a a problem connecting to why are the characters acting weirdly kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it it was weird. It was like an out-of-body experience. I was reading this chapter and I was like, am I reading Harry Potter right now? Like, it doesn't feel like I'm reading Harry Potter, which it was the first time I've ever felt that way, reading anything in the series. Um, Okay. I mean, and that's fair. I, I What I'm trying to say is, like, when you said it wasn't well-written, I was like, well, she's not, like, I mean, she's a, she's a great plotter that is different from a great yeah, writer. Yeah, I think the flaws, which usually we can overlook or are usually made up by lots of, you know, pros of her writing, you know, and therefore are overshadowed. I think the flaws were just very blatant in this chapter. Like okay. there just there wasn't anything redeeming to me. I was like, this was just a bad chapter all around, and not just because I didn't like what happened in it. I didn't like how it happened. Like I didn't like how it was presented to me as a reader. So when you say, okay, let's, let's rewind a little bit. So you said one of the reasons you didn't like this chapter was flaws, like in, in terms of like characterization, right? Like people acting out of character. Yes. Could you point us to some of those things and we could kind of discuss so those? So that, that is part of my, uh, my, uh, politic. So if you, if you want to talk about my politics, yeah, let's go into that. Okay. I mean, there are multiple, but I mean, the big one is really like what I want to talk about. Um, so my politic for this chapter is respect. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously there are lots of different ways to define respect. I think the one that, that we as humans know and use most often is, um, a feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. So that's like what we think of, I think, first when we think of respecting someone or giving someone respect. Um, The second one that I found that I think fits best for what actually happens in this chapter, though, is uh, do regard for the feelings, wishes, rights or traditions of others. Um, So to like respect someone's culture, to respect someone's wishes, um, Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, And so... (laughs) The main reason I chose this politic is because of something that Ron says regarding Voldemort in the chapter, which is my quote, which I can just say now if you want. Um, Yeah, that's fine. uh, The quote is, okay, it's, I'll just read the whole, the whole section. So at the very least, we should know they're coming. I can't guarantee it will keep out Vol. Don't say the name. Ron cut across her, his voice harsh. Harry and Hermione looked at each other. I'm sorry, Ron said, moaning a little as he raised himself to look at them, but it feels like a a jinx or something. Can't we just call him you-know-who, please? Dumbledore said fear of a name, began Harry. In case you hadn't noticed, mate, calling you-know-who by his name didn't do Dumbledore much good in the end, Ron snapped back. Just just show you-know-who some respect, will you? Respect, Harry repeated, but Hermione shot him a warning look. Apparently, he was not to argue with Ron while the latter was in such a weakened condition. This whole thing <laughs> really pissed me off. Okay. For, uh, for some, some for po- probably very, very obvious reasons. Um, first of all, what the fuck, Ron? What the fuck? Okay, well, okay. Actually, what the fuck, J.K. Rowling? What the fuck, author? Because, like... <laughs> Obviously, okay, so this is what's happening. She is wanting to tell the audience about the taboo on Voldemort's name, Mm -hmm. which we learn later in the book is anyone who says the name out loud can be traced. And I also went back and looked in, in the chapter, A Place to Hide, where they are escaping from the wedding and go into the coffee shop. 
I had to go back to look to re- to remember. But, yeah, and they, but they, the name, they, yeah. say, they say the word, like I think Hermione says the word Voldemort out loud immediately before they mention that the two workmen walk into the coffee shop. Correct. So this is just the author trying to tell the audience that there, that this taboo trace thing exists. Um, well, she's trying to, what I'm thinking of right now is that this is a clunky way of shoehorning that into, yes. Yes. into the plot. Probably after the fact. Yeah, this was the dumbest way to do it, though. Like, there are, like... No, but this is not the first time we've had this conversation about the way she does it. Yeah, it's it's awful. Like, to have a character like Ron, who we know <laughs> absolutely hates Voldemort, um, Voldemort has say, murdered... show some respect? Yeah, to say, show some respect, like... Because it, the, the author is literally just scrambling to try and find some reason to justify having Ron ask them to not say Voldemort's name out loud. Like, it's not respect. It's not like there. You, it's that is not the word. First of all, like that's an awful word choice. Like, how about instead of show Voldemort some respect, how about like I like plead to them in the fact of I. This is important to me as your friend. Can you just do this for me as your friend? I feel uncomfortable hearing the name right after, like, yes. I've lost so much blood. Like, you know, just I feel discomfort at this. Not yeah. have respect for this mass murderer. Right, exactly. So, like, it could just literally just be like, Ron could literally just say, like, I I, do, I can't explain why I don't want to say his name right now. I just don't feel like it's a good idea can we ju- can you just trust me and respect me as your friend and just do this for me because it's important to me and that would have well, made yeah. so much more sense than to say can you show Voldemort some respect yeah and, and you're completely right like in that because you could even he you could have even said like you know i know this isn't this is new to you or relatively new to you uh Harry and Hermione because you grew up in the muggle world but you weren't there when I was growing up and this was like a whole like boogeyman deal right I still feel really uncomfortable voicing the name and right now I just don't feel good physically this is not like you know it would really lend some depth to the character of Ron that is usually missing yeah yeah so I mean that that is like the root of my issues with this chapter. Obviously it's not the only thing. There were lots of things, but um, just, I mean, you know what this also, like my issue with this chapter in terms of um, like the choices that were made, yeah. like, you know how I told you about like, you know, editors, um, it, you know, they look at like, what is this doing in terms of like, you know, moving along the plot, that kind of thing. And sure. I think this is a, chapter that is meant to destabilize the trio like Mm -hmm. because they have to lose keep losing things in order for the story to move forward they can't be too comfortable yeah yeah and one of the things that happens in in this chapter is that Hermione takes them to the field where the Quidditch World Cup was um hosted and it's like are we doing a retrospective of every significant place throughout the series where they have been together kind of thing? Cause now that feels forced. Yeah, I could see that. Um, yeah. I mean, so in terms like, of like, they arrived by port key the other time, like how can, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, it's, so it's forced the last, to me. It's the last book in the series. How can we like tap in on all the other things that like made the series exactly? So like I need to yeah. weave a, a, a thread yeah. throughout all of it and do a retrospective of like the greatest hits. Yeah, which I mean, and like in the in the big picture, might not be like the worst thing. Like that can be nice, but I feel like the way that she presents it to the audience just doesn't it doesn't feel natural which is just yeah it just feels like forced which is why yeah. you're having that reaction yes. as well yes but so just this this interaction though that wasn't even the only thing that bothered me because um the way that 
okay, so the fact that Ron it, res, requested respect for Voldemort in the first place, dumb ass, stupid fucking decision. I don't know why they did that. But then to have Hermione and Harry really react in the way that they reacted, um, it, like that just makes it even worse because. Harry, Harry's like about to be like, what the fuck are you talking about, Ron? Respect. Like, we're not going to fucking respect Voldemort, right? Like, he's going to. The man who fucking murdered my parents. Yes, like he's a murderer. Like, the, the, what do you mean respect? First of all, I, I'm curious to know what the fuck, what, you, what the fuck Ron means by respect when he's saying this, first of all. But that's a different, before we get there. Um, Her, Hermione shot him a warning look. Apparently, he was not to argue with Ron while the latter was in such a weakened condition. That is the dumbest fucking shit I've ever read. Like, second dumbest after, can you just show Voldemort some respect? Um, like, her, okay. Hermione would not just, like, give Ron a pass for calling, for asking them to respect a murderer who murdered Harry's parents in front of Harry, like, in front of Harry. She would not just be like, oh, well, he's he's sick. Let's just, you know, let that sl that one slide. Like, what? No. This is ridiculous. Like, they just let it go. And then they just say, you know who, for the rest of the chapter, because it fits the plot. Oh, we if they say Voldemort, they'll get they'll get traced again. So we can't we have to make it so they don't say Voldemort. So we'll have them do this thing. And it makes no sense because Ron asked them to do this thing, which made no sense. Like I was like screaming the entire chapter, like this fucking makes no sense. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Oh my Do god! Do you think that maybe the trace, uh, uh, the 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 tracing aspect of it, might have been like overkill in this plot, like in this like series in this book? I uh, yeah, I feel like there has to have like I I kind of want to finish the the reread to be sure but i i'm sure like i feel like there is a like a reality where they could have left that out of the plot and i pro it probably wouldn't have made a huge difference yeah that's what I, that's where i'm going with it like yeah like perhaps I'm, it felt maybe it's like one of those items of like when she was plotting the she's book just trying to do too much i think right yeah where she's like oh wouldn't it be like really interesting if this da, da, da. Yeah. and she got really married to the idea and then shoehorned it in yeah and then the editor could. the editor was like okay so how do we like introduce this into the plot without it fucking over every other thing that we've talked about in the plot oh i don't know we'll just you know uh, have ron ask them to respect voldemort and not say his name and they'll just fucking do it with no questions but like instead of finding like a complex way of doing it, like I don't know, say like, hey, this is really making me very uncomfortable. Like, da, da, da. like no, 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 respect. That's yeah. the word. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just fuck. It just pisses me off. It is awful. It's so bad. Um, but yeah. So that's that's the main part of my politic. Um, some other things that have to do with respect, just so it makes so it's not just like an entire rant session. Um, I did notice that the theme the theme of respect um, shows up in the way that Harry kind of finds a newfound like, has a newfound respect for creature um, that he kind of talks about. Um, since first arriving at Grimmauld Place, he talks about like having like missing him even a little bit and his food. Um, which I mean, admiration goes wrong with respect. So like, that's definitely something that we're new or seeing in Harry. And then um, the, the 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 part that I guess like they're trying to show that Harry and Hermione are doing what Ron says in terms of not of instead instead of calling him Voldemort, saying you know who, um, they're using it as like a respecting his wishes. Um, mm -hmm. Because he's, you know, in ill health and almost died. And also because he's their friend and they like him and they respect him as a person and they, you know, you know, love him basically. So, um, you know, they respect their friend. Their friend asks for something. They do it. However, in real life, when a friend that you respect asks you something 
ask you to do something completely uncharacteristic and against your values, you don't just say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope you don't just say, okay, I'll, I'll compromise all my morals and values because I respect you and I'm not going to ask why you want me to do this thing. I'm just going to do it. Correct. Yeah. So we're not going to have like an in-depth conversation about it. We're just going to breeze through like this was shoehorned in for a major plot point. <laughs> right. So there we go. Respect. I don't respect what she tried to do with this chapter. Oh, man. <laughs> this is... <laughs> I I loved these, this ranting session, as you called it. Thank this you. was everything, Helene. Thank you so much. I needed it because I had a lot of anger after reading this chapter. <laughs> I'm not surprised that you didn't like the chapter. I'm just surprised at how much anger it elicited in you because I did not have the same reaction which is great because we don't have to have the same reaction all the yeah. time yeah definitely. but I, but now that you walked me through it I'm like yeah I can definitely see where the singer is coming from <laughs> yeah yep I just I'm interested to hear what your politic is <laughs> all right so my politic is definitely not respect but it's something that is related to it and that is the politics of leadership so, Helene, when we talk about leadership and think about it, we uh-huh. often think about, like, who has power and who holds the power, right? Yeah. But instead, I want us to kind of take a step back from thinking of, like, leadership as tied to power inextricably and instead talk about how people, like, ordinary people, choose to lead Um, whether it's through empathy, through example, decisiveness, and yeah, even through fear. So in this chapter, we see like examples of leadership that, you know, we may not agree with (laughs) our characteristic or not, but like Hermione is like taking the lead by, you know, uh, healing Ron. Ron is speaking up and is like, don't do this, show some respect or whatever. Um, Voldemort is uh, taking the fear out, definitely, in this chapter. And Harry is just, you know, sitting there, I guess. But also, I mean, there's some leadership aspects of this. But the one point in this chapter that I really thought was interesting was uh, this quote. Um, And I want to preface this to say that this quote is really interesting to me because of Hermione's way of admitting helplessness and her limitations, uh, which goes into direct contrast on how we usually think about, about leadership. Right. Yeah. So it says here, unstopper it for me, Harry, my hands are shaking. Harry wrenched the stopper of the little bottle. Hermione took it and poured three drops of the potion onto the bleeding wound. Greenish smoke billowed upward. And then it, when it had cleared, Harry saw that the bleeding had stopped. The wound now looks several days old, new skin stretched over what had just been open flesh. Wow, said Harry. It's all I feel safe doing, said Hermione shakily. There are spells that would put him completely right, but I daren't try in case I do them wrong and cause more damage. He's lost too much blood already. So here we see Hermione just openly admitting like, I hit my limit. I know that there are things that I could do, but I don't think I have like the skill set to do them and I don't want to make things worse. So that to me is a better picture of leadership than like someone who says like, fuck it, we'll just do it and see what happens. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think the the environment that is necessary for this type of leadership to happen is trust i think that she wouldn't have responded in this way if she didn't completely trust harry as well or if she didn't completely care about ron yeah so it's obvious it's you know obviously different but just the idea of like a leader who can say i don't know this or i am like harry please don't stop it my hands are shaking like yeah the 
to me, the idea of a leader who can show vulner- vulnerability in moments of difficulty is far more important than someone who's like shows a supposed steady hand but doesn't know what they're doing and therefore causes more damage in the end. Yeah, totally. Yeah, definitely. I'd much rather have a leader like that than like a leader like Voldemort, you know? <laughs> Which kind of makes us think about like what kind of Minister of Magic Hermione became. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I would love to like read a story, a short story about her like as minister, honestly. Yeah, or maybe like, not know. written by J.K. Rowling. Now that I've seen how bad she can write after this chapter, <laughs> um, but I would like to read it either way. <laughs> fair, fair. Um, yeah. So, any good fanfics anyone has out there to recommend? Please send yeah, it our, our way. Totally, I'll take it. Well, and, uh, you know, when we're talking about characters who display his politic, again, I want to, like, shout out Hermione, because usually yeah. we don't think of leaders as, like, vulnerable and open and showcasing uh, their limitations in that way and asking for help. And just because she, like, no one has put a place a, a of leadership on her, right? Like no one has said, Hermione, you're the leader. Doesn't mean she's not a leader. And that's the other thing that yeah. I wanted to talk about in this chapter is just like the idea that all of us lead, whether we see it or not, right? So just because we don't have like an official position of leadership doesn't mean we cannot influence others or we cannot influence situations. So how we choose to move in this world showcases the kind of leaders we are yeah um but i know i didn't talk about it during mine but i i chose ron as my character because well obvious reasons but his uncharacteristically demanding that we respect a murderer which whatever what the fuck uh but but then also the only reason that his friends abide his wishes is because they respect him and it's like how does that like idea of respect exists in those in both of those two like scenarios right like obviously yeah, they're so not Ron- going to respect <laughs> Voldemort like they respect Ron like <laughs> it's very strange uh, it's Ron's whole like outburst is just very weird and would make the worst like true crime podcast host ever like instead of respect the victims it's like respect the murder <laughs> right like and his the audacity to say that to harry of all people where who voldemort killed his parents in front of him and when he was you know, just a baby and keeps trying to kill him too right like oh just respect your parents murderer just shut up respect him Fuck you, Ron. Well, I mean, it's really not Ron's fault because he would never actually fucking say that. Fuck you, author. <laughs> I like how the further along we're getting into this podcast and where you're like becoming a slight Ron apologist, not like a hundred percent, obviously. Saying but, saying know. that it would that Ron would not <laughs> realistically <laughs> say to respect a murderer is like the lowest bar. <laughs> not me liking ron <laughs> just let me have my moment helene you have to respect me <laughs> just kidding oh my goodness you are funny oh. all right so helene you know this is the seventh book we have obviously the chapter where we shoehorn a lot of plot points into it <laughs> retrospectively and try to destabilize the trio but how do we see the politics of respect and leadership in the series? If you want, I can start with the respect aspect of it. Sure, I don't care. All right. So it's interesting to me to think about respect in the series because literally Voldemort's whole thing is like, I am not respected enough. I need to be respected by everyone but I'm going to do it 
by fear like by any means necessary and the shortcut is fear I'm gonna do it and it's gonna be great like he's just like such a tiny little man who wants to have respect the respect he and has, regard of others he has severe small dick energy <laughs> he also has small nose energy that's true okay. <laughs> then he does microscopic <laughs> nose energy <laughs> just non-existence <laughs> nose energy um <laughs> non-existent nose energy that should be a sticker i don't know if we're not making stickers anymore but it's so funny sorry <laughs> i mean i i'm i'm still making the stickers on the like backlog so i could add that to our list <laughs> non-existent nose energy actually let me write that down before i forget <laughs> Because we always say, like, great ideas, and then I'm like, oh, which episode did we say this on? I don't have time for this. <laughs> that is fair. That is very fair. Like, would I have to, like, listen to all our episodes to get, like, all our ideas? Probably, yeah. I guess I could. It would take yes. a long time, though. I understand that wanting to do that. All right, so... That being said... <laughs> And someone else who has like <laughs> small dick energy, as you call it, um, is Professor Snape, who's also like, everyone needs to respect me. <laughs> like, on like a smaller scale, he is that character at Hogwarts. Like, he's like, I don't get enough respect. I should get the Defense Against the Dark Arts post. Like, why am I here in the dungeons with the like potions? I want more. Like, he's he's kind of like, a dark little mermaid, you know, like I was literally singing, I want more. <laughs> <laughs> but also the entire time you've been talking, I've just been singing in my head, R E S P E C T. Oh no, I was doing that earlier <laughs> with your politics. <laughs> Amazing. Um and these are the times where we share our brain. Anyway, um, but you know who, like, doesn't demand respect, but, like, commands it through their actions? That is one Albus Dumbledore. Hell yeah, you know? is. He is a very well-respected figure in the wizarding world, and he doesn't demand respect. He commands it through his through his actions, and that is obviously more commendable, right? Like, so, like, the, the foils of, like, like, Dumbledore versus Voldemort and, like, the way that they they are respected or feared or whatever in like very different ways. And it's because of the ways that they move through the world is really interesting. Um, Totally. And usually it's our bad guys in these books. And yes, I am calling Snape a bad guy because he He is. He is. I'm sorry. He just is. He has a redemption arc, but that doesn't make him a good guy. Sorry, guys. Um, like Dolores Umbridge demands respect but does not earn it. Yeah. So she tries to like impose herself on people and impose the structure of the Ministry of Magic on the school because it's the only like power that she has to leverage over others. Um so in, she in has, thinking about respect, yeah. She has real non-existent dick energy because she doesn't have a dick. <laughs> And that has nothing to do with anatomy, guys. Like, that's just, like, the energy, you know? Yeah, her energy doesn't have a dick. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Anyway. (laughs) Just, just like, metaphorically is what we're talking about. Not, like, literal. Exactly. Although the non-existent nose energy is actually literal and metaphorical. Yeah, it just happens to fit. It just happens to fit. Yes, correct. So, yeah, the way that we see, like, respect through this series is is very much, like, usually the characters who demand respect instead of, like, earning it are, like, our bad guys. Yeah, no, that that tracks. Well. Which is why it's really sad to hear Ron saying that Voldemort deserves respect. Yeah. It's just like, I just, I just, well, I never, I will not understand what she was trying to achieve with that. Like, if someone has an idea of like, maybe I'm reading it wrong, I don't know. If you have 
a dissenting opinion, I would love to hear it because I cannot see a world in which that ever makes sense for him to say. Yeah, if you have a dissenting opinion, put on your RG, RBG collar. <laughs> right. And write us a note. Exactly. Or leave us a voicemail. Your choice. Yes. Well, uh, in terms of leadership in the series for your politic, I mean, it's everywhere, man. First of all, Harry is a big leader throughout the series um, in the DA, um, in the trio, honestly. Um, everybody's always looking to him to find the solutions, execute the solutions. Um, and then he fucks up a lot of the time and Hermione comes in and saves the day with the, with the solutions. But uh, <laughs> it's just reality of the situation. Um, but also Dumbledore in terms of but like he commands respect. And I think part of it is because of his exceptional leadership skills. Like he is yeah. a great, he's a great leader. Um, he's a great headmaster. He's a great leader of the order. Um, he, you know, he leads with compassion. He leads with empathy. He leads with um, vulnerability sometimes, at least with Harry. He definitely leads with vulnerability like you were talking about with Hermione. So um there are some great leaders, but then there are also some obviously not great leaders. Uh, Voldemort likes to lead through fear. Um, not the best way to do things. Um, I mean, Grindelwald uh, leads through manipulation, um, although we don't really see that in this in this series, but it's another type of leader. Um, so, I mean, we kind of see the whole spectrum. We see everywhere from the, the great to the truly, truly awful. Uh, Snape is an awful leader. He doesn't have respect for children. So that just shows you the kind of person he is. Uh, Umbridge, when she's trying to lead uh, the school as the High Inquisitor, um, no one respects her because she leads with through force um, and doesn't actually care to listen to what other people want or need. So that is not a great leader. Agreed. Yeah, that is the gist of it. All right, let's move on to our Dementors and Chocolate segment, where we talk about what we absolutely hated in this chapter and then what we absolutely loved. Um, Helene, who is your Dementor slash Ted Cruz for this chapter? The chapter is my Dementor. I mean, <laughs> the entire chapter. I I honestly couldn't think of like a redeeming quality in this chapter um i think i found like one thing possibly to somewhat say in my chocolate but honestly yeah no i mean if i had to pick one specific moment in the chapter it's my pol what i talked about my politics where ron asks them to risk asks harry to respect his parents murderer um yeah i don't have anything really good to say about this chapter so um, so the other part that uh, I thought was kind of like, really, we got to do this in this chapter author is my Dementor, which is like Hermione being so stubborn and shutting off Harry and being like, no, you're falling asleep. Go away. I'll sit out here and sulk. Like, yeah, yeah. No, like, come on. Um, that is my Dementor. Because not only is it out of character, but it also um, low-key reminds me of my own worst traits, which is, like, <laughs> I can be like this and petty and, like, when I don't get my way, like, yeah. in kind of situations, I'm like, no. Yeah, I'll like, in the chapter, she's, like, it's obvious she's, like, punishing him for not yeah. doing occlumency or whatever, which she never but, fucking uh, shuts up about, ever. So... <laughs> She's like, I'm not getting my way because he's not closing his mind off to Voldemort. Man, man, man. I'm going to make him feel bad by telling him to go inside and I'm going to finish his watch because he is just being rude. Like, she's like a little cry crying, whiny bitch baby. Well, I too can be a crying, <laughs> whiny bitch baby <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and it, it's like a reminder of like, Man, this is so annoying when someone else does it. <laughs> like, yeah. 
I, I don't think I've ever experienced that side of you, but I, I mean, I believe when you say that that exists, but I have not myself. I mean, I, I have to be honest, right? Like we all have like really negative traits. So obviously I'm not the only one. Uh, we, we see Snape obviously in the series. Um, so it's, I'm not I'm, that level yet. I'm pretty sure I'm perfect. I don't think I have any flaws. Oh, but you know, excluding <laughs> you, obviously. <laughs> um, but like, I know that sometimes when I care too much and too deeply about something and it's not going my way and it's the, and I feel personally attacked by people around me for not doing what <laughs> I want them to do, I'm just like, oh, I'll just do it. You know, no, don't, no, do not help me. No, mm-mm, bye, bye, leave <laughs> do, me alone. Do not help like, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, seriously, like, people will be like, no, but let me, no, nope. I'm like, nope. Just let me do it. I'm goodbye. Leave me yeah. alone. Like you so just want like, you don't want to make them feel bad for fucking up. Basically, like this is your way of punishing I, them. Le- yeah, let me fume in peace. Like <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. And I'm trying to be better about that, but you know, sometimes those things are in you, and they're programmed from a very young age. You know. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But yeah, that's that was the the my dementia, but only because I was like, oh, ah, uh, this reminds me of a visceral thing from myself that I don't like in myself. That's fair. But um, what did you actually like? Question mark. Um. Okay. So the one moment I could find that I didn't absolutely hate. Well, I have complaints about it, but I'll get to it. Um. The the one moment that I decided to call out in my chocolate is. Um, it's the moment where like Hermione is kind of blatantly falling more in love with Ron when he's expressing concern for the catamole's well-being. Um, like it's like a very throwaway line where Harry like observes that Hermione is like looking at him with all of this like admiration and love in her eyes as Ron is sitting there like I hope the catamoles are okay. Like, you know, um, so like the sentiment is cute. I like that. Like the, the, we are seeing Hermione like blatantly, like have more feet, like showing more feelings towards Ron in this book. And it's like more slowly building up so that at the end, when they do kiss, it's not like, well, where the fuck did this come from? You know? <laughs> um, which so like I appreciate that. However, I do still have a gripe with this, and that gripe <laughs> is like, oh, you have decent respect and consideration for another human's life. How cute! You've reached the lowest bar. Like, <laughs> literally, she's she's like showing admiration for him because he is concerned about another human's life other than his own. Congrats, Ronald. I mean, but have you seen like the, like the bar is in hell. Honestly, it's honestly like, you know, he just, like it is it is i i can't imagine a world in where i wouldn't be concerned for the catamoles like after what they just witnessed so like the fact that like she's she's like showing all this love and ad- admiration for him after he's just like oh i hope they're okay like yeah you i better fucking hope that you hope they're okay if you didn't fucking give a shit about them for 2 seconds then i would be concerned <laughs> so you know there's there's a light and a dark side to, to this chocolate really it's there's white chocolate and dark chocolate <laughs> okay well fair 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 um <laughs> my chocolate was harry thinking about creature and kind of feeling sad and like forlorn about creature when you know i feel like we wouldn't have gotten that reaction earlier on. It's character growth. Yeah. Um, and it, I believe that the narrator like states that it had nothing to do with the food. Like, it's like it was not about like the actual food that he was feeling like sad and like nostalgic for creature. He was just like, 
oh I, man i was really starting to enjoy like spending time with creature i'm worried like what is he gonna think like that yeah, we're not coming back and that kind of stuff i think that like when they talk about the food too it's like it was more that if he felt bad about the food it was that he felt bad that like creature made like took the all day to like make this steak and kidney pie and they're yeah, not exactly. there to, and like they're not going to be there to eat it it wasn't like, oh, darn, I'm missing the food. It was like, That's Aw. what I'm saying. Like, it had yeah. nothing really to do with eating the food. It was yeah. more about, like, the effort and then Creature not getting to see them and, like, all these things. And, like, is Creature safe kind of thing? That was my chocolate. Yeah. He R-E-S-P-E-C-T's him more. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> Good for him. All right. Every week we ask one question pertaining to the chapter. And this week we have a new one. So as we talked about completely through this episode, Ron asks Harry and Hermione that they show some respect towards Voldemort. What do you think he meant by that? I can't wait to hear these answers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I want to hear, like, I mean, if do you agree with me uh, that it was just completely uncharacteristic? Or do you think that there is a, a meaning behind it that maybe I missed or, um, you know, that like a different perspective that he could have been coming at it from? Uh, because, I mean, it is just a very odd thing to be done. And so maybe there is something that other people saw or are reading into the situation that, you know, we're not. And I would love to hear that. All right. That being said, it's time for the media we've been consuming. Pauline, what has been making your life bearable? Okay. You know this briefly because I, I texted you when it was happening. But um, a book that I read on your recommendation, I, I can't remember. You've read this book, right? Oh, yes. Okay, so oh, there's. Yes. Um, I knew that you. Ha- I knew that you were a fan of this author because you had recommended some of her other books as well. I just couldn't remember if you had recommended this specific book. But um, there is a book called "People We Meet on Vacation," and it's by an author, a wonderful author named Emily Henry. Um, and I wouldn't categorize it as like w- when people say romance, they think of like steamy erotica, you know, like there's sex scenes, you know, and it's like about sex, right? Um. I wouldn't really categorize this book in that way. It's more of like a... Okay, so, okay, can I, can I, like... Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Can I Adri explain romance to you? Okay, so there are, like... Okay, oh, I'm so excited about this. All right, so romance, my favorite genre ever. There are multiple different ways of thinking about romance novels and categorizing them. The most popular category of romance novel is the ones with the the sex scenes, right, on them. And those are categorized as romance and not erotica when there is character development. Yes. So a romance novel can have tons of banging on the page and not be considered erotica as long as there is character development. It only becomes erotica when there's just banging and no character development. Right. Okay. Question though. Does yes. a romance novel have to hit a quota of sex scenes in order to be considered a romance novel and not just a novel? No. There are what they're called closed door romances, which are also one of my favorite genres of I mean, I will I will read any romance novel, honestly. Like I love like it is my favorite. Like I am not kidding when I say it's my favorite there are romance novels where there's not even a kiss until the end of the romance novel and that is still a romance novel because it's all about like the emotional intimacy Uh, of the characters yeah i feel like okay i know it's too late to change the scope and like the landscape of literature because that has (laughs) been established long before i came on the scene by by white men Yes, yes continue but i feel like stories like that and stories like this honestly because yes this has one sex scene it has one sex scene it alludes to other like sexy things happening that are off the page but in terms of like actual sex it only it's happens more about once. emotional intimacy yes. yes it's more it's more about okay so 
anyway, so where I was getting with this was, um, like books like this and books like what you said, where like, it's just about like the, the, the characters falling in love and like they don't kiss until the end or whatever. I think that should be categorized as a love story, not a romance. Okay. So, but, but the way that, you know, our categories are already established, that is called a can I change it? romance. <laughs> You can change it. You can uh, let's be a because, maverick. I'm because, just telling like, you, this one wouldn't cat, but wouldn't fit as a closed door romance because there is a sex scene. But okay, I okay, don't, yeah, yeah. But I don't so, think it's so, a romance let, novel. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, all right. So let, let, I get really excited about this. Let me keep romance waiting. <laughs> so there are other books where you know romance books where it's still considered a closed door romance when there is no sex on the page but it alludes to sex having been happened in in the plot right so like let's say you're reading this book and they kiss and some like you know first base second base things happen then it like fades out and it's the next morning right like basically like your rom-com like, like on a tv Hollywood. show yeah like on a movie yeah tv show that is still considered a closed door romance because there's like not a like pmv action or you know like there's yeah, yeah. no third base type situation then <laughs> Uh, so th- that's like the difference between a uh, open door and closed door romance. Then there's a genre called chick lit, which is has romantic elements, but it's mostly about the development of the character herself as she grows into like, I don't know, herself, her career, whatever. And that usually does have a romantic element that usually has like, and she and they fall in love by the end. But because it focuses more on like, the characters' relationships with other characters around her and like on her career yeah, or on yeah. her goals or whatever, even though it has a romantic element, it's considered quote chiclet because it's more about like Okay, so the, you would you world. would categorize this as chiclet. A little it's between chiclet and romance. To me, okay. it falls between those two. Okay. Yeah, because like I feel like because I after I finish this book and I will go into a little bit more detail just uh, in a I was but, so excited that you chose this book because I was like Helena's gonna fucking love this book <laughs> oh oh before I get there um like after I finished this book first of all I wanted to recommend it to literally fucking everyone I knew and that included <laughs> and that included my family because I knew that my family would love this book okay it's so but when I told them it's a romance novel I was I, ha- I felt like I had to clarify like it's not like it's not like a romance, like, it's not like what you're thinking of. It's not like erotica, like, there's no, there's not a lot of fucking ste- steamy, st- it's not like Bridgerton, you know? Like, I love Bridgerton so much, but it is I not know. like Bridgerton. Um, Like, I would not recommend Bridgerton to my family. I love Bridgerton, but I'm not going to say, go read a book where, like, people have graphic sex, like, scenes in it, like, four or five times, at least, in the book. Like, that's just not something I would recommend to my family like dad you know it's not gonna happen but uh, anyway Um. okay so that just reminded me okay one of my favorite authors meg cabot the author of princess diaries started her career writing romance novels and the first few romance novels she started writing were under a pseudonym right so she like i think it was either like her second or third novel she was like how much like steamy scenes get you pack into a romance novel without your editor being like this is too much so she like went like went on to this like thing of like basically she says like in my head I call this humping on a pirate boat like (laughs) book and no one told her to stop Helene she tried to put in as many scenes steamy scenes as possible on this novel trying to be like what is the limit and you know what she came back with? The limit does not exist. <laughs> like to answer your earlier question. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, back to the people we meet on vacation. Because okay, so I'll just tell you tell the story of, of the book. Okay. Not the whole I'm not gonna tell you the plot of the book. The story of my journey with the book. Okay. Um I had to drive to a wedding for in Wisconsin uh, two weeks ago, and um, it's about a five-hour drive for me, and I was doing it alone. And so on the way there, I listened to podcasts and blah, 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 and I got through it without you know pulling out an audiobook. On the way back, I decided, okay, I'm going to start this audiobook. I got in this one. I was like, you know what? 
you know, I, if I don't like it, I'll stop. I'll switch it over to a different one. Like, it's fine. Um, I This book, first of all, okay, so it's a 10-hour audiobook. The drive was about four and a half hours long. Uh, five hours with stops, really. Um, I got home. I didn't want to stop listening to the book. So, like, I just listened to the book, like, while I was home and, like, while I was doing, like, making dinner and, like, feeding my cats. And, just like, I literally, like, the last, like, three hours of the book, I just laid on my bed with headphones in and listened to the book. Like, I didn't move. Like, it just, like, <laughs> it, it, like, if anything, I, like, maybe played some solitaire on my phone just to, like, have my hands do something while I was listening to the book. Um, I finished the entire 10-hour audiobook in one day. Because I, it, because, yeah. well, well, the thing is, like, I, I read pretty quickly. Like, if, if I had had this in a physical copy of a book, I probably would have finished it in, like, a couple hours. Like, it wouldn't have taken me 10 hours to read the book. Um, at least I don't think so. Um, so, because I was, like, limited to, I only had it on an audiobook, and the audiobook was 10 hours. I, it had to take me 10 hours to read the book. Um, so I, I full on like sobbed at least three times listening, mm -hmm. listening to this audiobook, like to the point where I had to grab tissues um, and like blow my nose. <laughs> like that was the level. Uh, it was so well written. It was so moving. And I honestly didn't think that I would be able to be like captured by a book. Like I thought that the reason I loved other romance novels I read was because of like the steaminess of them, right? But this was such a beautiful, like slow burn story of love and but like friendship. Like, oh my God. And then the end, oh, it just, oh my God, it killed me. Um having finished it, okay, first of all, I can't recommend the book enough. So go go read People Would Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. I this is this has skyrocketed probably to my top five favorite books. I will most likely read this multiple times. I need to find a I like to when I own a book, I like to own it in hardcover. Um I don't like paperback books. I don't like the way that spine bends and everything. Um I like them to be durable. So um I need to I've find been looking for the hardcover. So let me know if you find it. Cause I can't find it. That's what I was gonna say. I haven't been able to find it yet. Uh, so like the, it's sold out like on, like they don't have a good, they don't have it on Amazon. They don't have it on like the, any of the thrift store, like bookshops that I've been looking at. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking for it on hardcover because I will most likely reread this book many times in my life. So, um, but immediately after I finished, I went out and I bought book lovers by Emily Henry, which is also, uh, the same author and I bought the hardcover because I was like I'm gonna just want to read this probably in one sitting as well so I, I'm not gonna buy the audiobook um so I'm going to read that very soon I have a couple other books that well one I have other books I have to read for because I have like third time crunches but I cannot wait to read that one um anyway I can't recommend the book enough also I've also been watching Monk which I'd never watched um and I was convinced to watch by a friend. So I don't know if you've watched Monk, but it is quite endearing. I have watched like snippets of some episodes, but I haven't like, you know, watched the series. So I might start. Yeah, eventually. I, I have to put it down. I was skeptical, skeptical because like, you know, he has like a like an actual mental illness. Like he has severe OCD. Right. And like, um, I didn't know if they were going to handle it well. Mm hmm. Um, and like make a joke out of it, which sometimes they do make a joke out of it, but I don't think that it's handled. Um, I mean, overall poorly, I think, I think it, I think that they, they do a good job, um, in general. Plus I just love crime procedurals. I love mysteries. Um, so it's a fun one. Speaking of uh, procedurals that you love. Uh, did you finish the, um, well, did you watch the finale of She-Hulk? Oh my God. I fucking love that show. Yes. That, that finale was so good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, it was so great. I'm like, I just keep on thinking of <laughs> the part. Sorry. I don't, I guess I don't want to spoil it for, for people, but, um, 
where she asks when we're going to get the X-Men and then she like makes the funniest face in the whole world. I just, I literally, yeah. it was, I lost it. I rewatched that part like four times. I was like, go back, watch it yep. again. Yep. Um, so it was great. It was great. I liked uh, the part where her dad was uh, grilling her uh, romantic prospect. I'm not going to say, it. I'm not going to spoil it for a lot and of people. But... Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And then he was like, every conversation is heading there. <laughs> like, what are yeah. you talking about? Yeah, it, that is just such a delightful show. And the people, like the like the Marvel fans who, like, hate it, they they honestly just don't understand it, I don't think. I don't no. think they don't get what it's trying to be. And not everything is for you guys, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. It, the thing is, in an IP this big, not everything is for everyone. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah, like Falcon and the Winter Soldier was probably for them. It wasn't really for me, to be honest. But I watched it, and She Hulk was definitely yeah. for me. So, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's not you don't have to like everything in an IP. You know, like yeah, yeah. You can have it. You know, varying degrees of like I tolerate it to I fucking loved it, and I just fucking love this show so much yeah she hulk was amazing i i'm probably gonna that like i've rewatched wandavision because that is one i think probably the best marvel show or thing that marvel's put out ever. yeah but the tone is completely different though yes like it's um, like they also have such different tones all of these i just meant like in fact that like i i have rewatched wandavision and i will most likely rewatch she hulk i don't usually rewatch a lot of marvel things in general because yeah, there's so much okay. like there's just so much stuff that it's like unless i really freaking loved it like i'm not gonna take the time to rewatch it because there's Fair. like gonna be a new marvel thing in a week anyway so like <laughs> <laughs> why go back and rewatch something that already i already saw you know yeah so no it was great um i've been watching that obviously but also a show that is very near and dear to my heart its final season is now streaming on netflix and that is dairy girls and it is i don't know if, have you watched dairy girls i have not watched it but i i do know, i've heard of it and i know that the girl who plays penelope and bridgerton is in it i know that yes beautiful she's gorgeous i love her she's one of my favorite characters in the show um so dairy girls is about a group of girls and one boy who live in <laughs> london dairy ireland okay and it's about like it's in the, set in the 90s and it has like all this political stuff going around it but it's really just about like what it was being like a girl in the 90s right so obviously as someone who was a girl in the 90s probably Same. not like their their age but like around their age i'm like very endeared by it and it has like um ideas about colonialism like i'm not selling this show it's like really funny and endearing <laughs> but i also enjoy it on like a meta level because it's like oh it's exploring like ideas about colonialism and imperialism and yeah also has really sick jokes and like they're catholic <laughs> and i grew up catholic and they go to a catholic school i also went to a parochial school like all these things right so i don't know really enjoyed it a plus plus dairy girl season three haven't finished it yet because we're trying to like slow roll it but like i watch dairy girls all the time <laughs> i watch it and rewatch it so like it's not it's probably something i'm gonna rewatch again anyway yeah i'm having trouble just like catching up and like i have like like three things that came out this week that i i already haven't had any time to sit down and watch like the third season of um unsolved mysteries came out or started like started um mm -hmm. on netflix and i love that show and i haven't watched that yet and like the vow part two on um on hbo max about the nexium cult just came out i want to watch that um Ooh, i need to watch that yeah um so it's just like i'm trying to keep up on everything the new season of grays um, I don't know if you've watched that or if you're caught up on Grey's, but they started. I am not caught up. Okay, yeah, they started season 19, and it's very obvious that they're just trying to they're trying to capture the magic of the first season with like you know they're trying to kind of recreate um the feeling that everybody had when it was you know George Meredith Izzy Christina Alex. Yeah, they've been trying um, to do that for a few seasons now. It's not working. Yes, well, with this one, 
it has it's working better than it has ever before. I don't know if it's like completely working on me, but it is so far I'm not hating it. I'm actually kind of liking it, which is surprising. Okay, cool. So that's interesting. Um, just because I mean it's like 19 seasons, right? And it's like oof, at some point you think Jeez. it's just going to jump the shark. It, it probably has multiple times, but uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just so fucking busy. I haven't had time to like sit down and watch all the things I want to watch. So, okay, but okay. One last thing before we uh, sign off on the show, how perfect is Emily Henry's like plotting and like her fucking oh. opening of this book? Oh my god! Like the fact that okay, I don't know. Like she can jump from storyline to storyline so seamlessly, and it fe- like it feels like okay. So like for people who haven't read the book just so you get an idea. Basically, every other chapter, um, it, it goes between telling the story of the current summer of like the present day. Mm-hmm. And um, then every every other chapter is going back and telling the story of a summer that they spent together for the, like the last like nine years. And so it's like, yeah. And it's like, and it's, and it's in order to like, yes, like this is how they met. This is the next summer after that. And it like leads up to that last summer that they allude yes. to. And like the first, you know, it's like, yes. the tension. And so, like you're so invested in like the, the current present day summer. Like you want to know what happens with these characters that like when it cuts away to like nine summers ago or whatever, you're like, I, I always would start the chapter with like, Oh no, like, I don't care about how, what, about what happened nine summers ago. I want to know what's going to happen next. And then yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And then like they, they would start the chapter and it'd be like, Oh my God, this is so good. Tell me more. And, and you then, get sucked <laughs> in and yeah. it would like, but then, and then, and then it would like cut to the present and yeah. then you're like, Oh my God. <laughs> and like, oh, but I forgot how excited I was to find out about this i can't wait to hear yeah so like it keeps you in wrath the whole time and then not only that but as the summers go on like you you're learning things about the characters and like their pasts and everything that it like like it's such a well timed out place that like it's just like oh my god it wouldn't have made no it, like i wouldn't have want to learn wanted to learn about this one thing that happened at any other point in this book like like it's just so perfect and I don't remember if I said this but I need to read a book written from his perspective Alex Nelson's perspective I need a book from his perspective because I love like reading it from Poppy's perspective was obviously like great and I loved it and um Poppy isn't my like like I I can't relate to Poppy a lot so that's that was a little hard um for me but but, you know for you that okay so for you to say i couldn't relate to her but still fucking love the book shows how fantastic (laughs) emily henry is yeah like i feel like i could more relate to him um but i loved their dynamic and i loved their relationship and how it grew and how we grew to love them separately and then together just like yes it just like worked so perfectly but um like finding out at like near the end like what he's been going through this whole time like from his from poppy's perspective like him telling her how he's been like what he's been feeling and all of this like i would have have just loved to have like experienced that with him like when did he realize that like he had these feelings what was he thinking during all these situations because we only see it from her perspective and then, like, at the end, you're like, holy shit, like, he was thinking this way the whole time, and I had no idea, like. Well, and also shows, like, how complex um, emotions and relationships and friendships can be, where it's, like, just because, I, I hope I'm not spoiling this, like, just because you're committed to something or someone else doesn't mean you can't have, like, things that contradict that and it's not like all or nothing yeah two things can be true at the same time like you you can have a love for someone and still not have it be the right thing in for your you in your life at that time like it yeah it's so it it navigates those complexities so beautifully um i was by the end i was just like that is how you fucking tell a story like yeah it wasn't just the characters or like the the plots or like the actual events that happened in the story at the end it was like 
the way she told that, like the way that she was able to keep my attention and like not like there wasn't like a bad part. Like it was so the dialogue, Helene. The dialogue <laughs> alone deserves all the awards. Yes. And the the narrator for the audiobook was just so great. And the way that the way that she like talks in her writing, like it's so natural and it doesn't feel forced. Um, it feels like like a friend is telling me the story. Yeah. Yeah, no, Emily Henry is fantastic. Doesn't and feel like, like a narrator is telling me a story or an author is telling me a story. It feels like a friend is telling me a story. It's great. So, like, for me, of the Emily Henry books, and I'm not saying this is bad, because, you know, I, I'm a ride or die for Emily Henry. Like, I am ride or die. She only has, that. like, three or four books, I think. Oh, she has more books in the YA section, but, like, okay. for for the uh, adults, um, it's these three. So... For me to say, and I kid you not, this is my least favorite Emily Henry book. Oh my god. I'm not saying I don't like it. I fucking love it. I adore it. I would die for it. Imagine how much I like book lovers. Okay, so is book lovers your favorite? It is my absolute favorite book. Okay, well. From Emily Henry. Shit. That's the one I'm reading next, so. <laughs> Beach Read was like my number one for like for a very long time and then I read book lovers and I was like fuck it like this is number one now it is like oh like God. she blew it out of the water for me specifically and maybe it's because I can relate to the um main character a little too much but <laughs> <laughs> like I can't imagine how much more I would have liked this book if I could relate to Poppy like I thought okay so for sure I thought this you were gonna like this book a lot because it's a very like friends to lovers I love friends to lovers plot. Yeah. yeah and that's kind of your your thing right yeah like I'm not going to like I, I don't think this is spoiling it but like book lovers is more like of an it's enemies an, yeah, lovers. yeah I read this the synopsis was definitely enemies lovers and I I haven't read enough or really like experienced enough stories I feel like in that genre to really know if I'm gonna love it Okay, I don't so think like, I'm gonna for hate example, it. for example, Pride and Prejudice is like archetypal enemies to lovers. Yeah, I've never really gotten into that one, but I don't think it's because it was enemies to lovers. It's just no, 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 no it's just like I'm just trying to like, yeah. like it's it's it can go from like I fucking hate you, I want to fuck you, to like you're annoying, I don't want to talk to you, and then being forced to have to talk to that person and slowly realizing, oh shit, all these things that I made up in my mind about you aren't right. You're actually a really cool person to be around. Yeah, no, I think I'll like it. I do. I do think I will like it. Um, I mean, if you think about it, uh, Chris Pine and Anne Hathaway and princess diaries to the Royal engagement. They are. Oh, enemies that is lovers. definitely enemies to lovers. <laughs> that is archetypal enemies to lovers. Yes. So, and that is, that is like injected into my veins. I love enemies to lovers. Not because like, it mirrors any kind of relationship I've ever had, but it's just, it's just my, I love it. Like, I just, maybe it's because I like being mean a little bit. When, like, I, like, if I'm flirting, I'm really mean about it. People usually think I'm flirting when I'm being nice, but like, when I flirt, I'm really mean. Because <laughs> I am a feral cat, okay? <laughs> right. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I do, friends to lovers really gets me. Um, really really deeply i love it but i am excited to to try this other this other type of story this other flavor yes flavor oh it's great i love it i love it so much again just put it in my veins seth says okay so my um my stylist my hairstylist told me this is something a, a friend of her quoted to her as like this is her relationship and i was like oh my god this is me too She's like, you guys have feral cat girlfriend energy and <laughs> golden retriever boyfriend energy. Oh my god! And I was like, that is me and Seth. Oh my oh god! That's hilarious. I'm a feral cat, and he's like golden retriever, like doing, like you know, he's always like so oh. nice and so happy, and I'm just like mean. <laughs> oh my gosh! I love it. That's hilarious. So forever that for me. Um. Yeah, so I'm excited for you to 
eventually read more Emily Henry books and I'm excited for her to keep on cranking those books like I need yeah. her I can't believe she to... only has three books like she needs to have 20 books well the thing is it's okay so the thing with chiclet or like or you know books written by these authors that are a little bit I don't want to sound derogatory towards romance at all. It, I am not trying to be that. It's that when you have a really good contract, like Emily Henry has a good contract, she can take more time between writing books so that these books are like more complex and like have more depth. And, you know, there's more of a revision process in like the editing and stuff, right? Yeah. But when you have a less good contract, which is usually like, those paperback romance novels have a less good contract for authors, right? Like in less, less marketing campaigns and stuff like that, there's a shorter time frame for you to finish writing your book, right? So if in order to stay relevant, you have to continue publishing more and more books, but the quality may not be as good as like an Emily Henry book. So that, that also sense. goes into it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, until you, like, make it, like Julia Quinn did with the Bridgerton series, her, like, books probably couldn't be spaced out too much. Right, because it would lose momentum or whatever. And she would lose money because she's not getting paid so much. Right. So, you know, quality over quantity type thing. Anyway, <laughs> that being said, oh my god, we did like a very deep dive into, <laughs> into books today. Not just with plotting, but also with romance. Anyway, <laughs> that's it for today's episode. Please join us next time as we talk about chapter 15 of Harry Potter and the Deadly Hallows. And this one's titled The Goblin's Revenge. Yes, and if you've enjoyed this conversation about R-E-S-P-E-C-T and uh, non-existent nose energy and people we meet on vacation by Emily Henry uh, and also, I guess, Harry Potter too. Um, <laughs> please take a second to review us um, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this right now with a big five-star rating. It helps people find us, which, I mean, that's what we want in life is for people to know we exist. So please do that. Thank you. And until then, politics managed. Support this show by going to patreon.com slash Occupolitics. Our patrons keep this show going. You can find us online at Occupolitics.com and we are at Occupolitics on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can email us your thoughts at info at Occupolitics.com. Leave us a voicemail at 915-996-1699 and you might just hear yourself on the podcast. Adriana Wilson is the founder and creative director of the podcast. Helene Karp is the producer and social media manager. Allison Pullman is the audio wizard and editor who makes us sound so good. Cover art and physical rewards are designed by Adriana Wilson. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are expressly their own and not representative of their employers or associates. Occupolitics is part of the MuggleNet family of podcasts.